Another thing that I, a mindset I'd like to take for us is not just to get people on the bus, but to get non-riders to think of taking public transportation because of showcasing to them, hey, you want to go here to here? Well, take public transportation to get from here to here. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals from around the world. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Welcome to another edition of Transit Unplugged in Depth. This is a really special episode where Paul has traveled to Music City, Nashville, Tennessee, to chat with Steve Bland and his team at the Nashville Metropolitan Transit Authority. But what makes this episode special isn't just that Paul recorded some fabulous discussions with really amazing leaders in the transit industry, is that they also videoed this episode and it will become one of the first Transit Unplugged TV episodes coming to you this fall. So have a listen, hope you enjoy it. Great to be with you, Steve. I'm with Steve Bland, CEO of Nashville MTA, We Go Transportation, and we are in your grand downtown station, right? Good morning, welcome. Yeah. Thank you, thanks for having us. This is our first ever Transit Unplugged video as well as audio podcast. And uh, Steve graciously agreed to uh, to be our first guest. So thank you. Sure. I, I, you can't embarrass me. It's, uh, <laughs> it has, everybody's tried and it hasn't been done yet. Well, you're looking great. Your facility looks great. I mean, we're here um, in September of 2021. Just kind of give us a status of how things are going sure. here in Nashville now. Sure. Uh, well, obviously, we're sort of in the um, in the ups and downs of the pandemic restoration. Uh, in terms of Nashville as a city, certainly things are recovering very well. Our day tourist market is pretty much all the way back. We're still waiting for um, for more recovery to get more of the business meeting and certainly the international tourism market back. International tourism before the pandemic was huge here. Um, so that's something that's still coming back. But the city's bustling again. And in terms of our system, we go back to our full service levels in October. So we're at about 90 percent of prior service levels. We're at a, approaching about 70, 72 percent of our prior ridership levels. And uh, oh, that's from, good. from my perspective, what's good about that is it's a nice, slow, steady. It's not an onslaught. Several significant markets that are still kind of weak, I think, as with most systems, are the downtown office commuter who are largely still working remotely. And we're seeing some um, uh, public school kids are a big part of our market, and we're really only seeing them at about a third to a half uh, what that normal market is. So, so those are two areas for us to be looking at in the future. But it's allowed us to pivot some of our service models. We've really beefed up service in our key, our busiest corridors, which fell off the least during the pandemic and were quickest to recover. So in fact, in October, when we go back to full service, we'll actually be extending service hours to about one in the morning. Awesome. So uh, give us a little bit of the scope, if people aren't familiar with the scope of service you provide, sure. number of buses, what type sure. of services you have, those kind of things. Well, Nashville, despite the size of the city, we really only have one fixed guideway alternative, and, and that's I refer to it as our baby train, um, the WeGo Star commuter train. It's a 32-mile commuter rail line that runs out to the eastern suburbs, um, and that is primarily commuter, so ridership on, that, on the Star is still way down. Other than that, it is a bus network, a uh, pretty traditional um, urban bus network. Nashville Street Network is radial in nature, so most of our routes kind of come out of this facility in the heart of downtown Nashville and go out into our neighborhoods. We do have some cross towns and connectors, um, and that's essentially what we've been restoring. So a lot of our focus, um, frankly, while things have been down, is upgrading bus stops and shelters, uh, we're on a program to pretty aggressively build a series of neighborhood transit centers. We've got one under construction now, one in design, um, three in, in future development. So that, that program is going pretty much um, full speed ahead. That's great. And tell us about the political structure here. Is sure. Nashville MTA part of the city government? That kind of thing. Yep. So we go public transit, which is our marketing name, is actually two organizations. One is the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Nashville and Davidson County. It's an independent authority, but it is a component unit of the metropolitan government of Nashville and Davidson County. And Nashville is one of the cities around the country that has unified city county government. So the mayor of Nashville is the mayor of Davidson County, similar with the, the uh, Metro Council. 
So the MTA part of WeGo Public Transit operates our traditional urban transit service. Then the other organization is the Regional Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee. That is a creature of the state of Tennessee created by the state legislature probably about 20 years ago. And basically it encompasses a 10 county area surrounding Nashville. So it's essentially um, Davidson County and the surrounding um, suburban and yeah. to some extent exurban counties. And it includes places like the city of Clarksville, which is in Montgomery County, city of Murfreesboro, in Rutherford County, city of Franklin and Williamson County. All three of those cities have their own independent public transit systems that connect into the RTA system, which is the WeGo Star commuter train running out to the east and about six uh, commuter bus corridors that we operate. Okay. And so what's the population of that big service area that you're... Sure. Well, the, the national metro uh, area in the 2020 census with the numbers that were just released is just a touch under 2 million. I think it's something like 1,983,000 people. Wow, that's great. And growing very quickly. We grew about uh, 10 or 11% in the last 10 years. Wow. And your budget? Total between the two organizations, about $100 million a year in operating. And uh, the capital fluctuates depending on what we're doing, but typical capital budget would be in the 20 to $30 million range. And on fares, are, did you go free fare during COVID? Where are you at now? What's your fare box yeah, recovery we, ratio? That kind of stuff. We did, uh, we did during COVID. We put fares back in place uh, quite a while ago, probably okay. six months or so ago. Uh, we are moving to contactless fare payment. So we're rolling out, we're slowly rolling out our quick ticket mobile payment um, and, and contactless smart card system. So that's gaining traction. We'll do a full rollout in January. Um, so that's something that we're very excited about and that's working very well. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, when you and I were talking the other day, I said, so tell me some of the things that are happening there. And you rolled through a list of like yeah. 20 big projects you're yeah. working on. And actually, I'm excited today that you've you brought some of your st staff with you that, that yeah. we're gonna be able to kind of dig in deep on this. Uh, in your mind, uh, I mean, to me, you're one of the most innovative transit systems in America right now, all the things that are coming out of COVID. How are you doing all this? I mean, you know, <laughs> people have been saying, oh, you know, transit's in a downward spiral, yeah. you know, a death spiral. Remember the New York Times last yeah. July, you know, but you're like doing just the opposite. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think part of it is the, the dynamic nature of Nashville as a city. I mean, it's growing very rapidly. Um, and frankly, a lot of folks who are coming in are coming in from those large urban markets that are used to having a very robust transit system. Um, we are, for lack of a better word, not a mature transit system in a rapidly maturing city. So a lot of what we're orienting to, frankly, Paul, is catching up to where a lot of other cities around the country are. Uh, I think one of the exciting opportunities is the city of Nashville just created a city department of transportation. Obviously, it's focused on things like traffic signals, traffic management systems, streets and sidewalks. But very much, they, they very specifically titled it the Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure. So there's several projects we're working on jointly with NDOT, our new NDOT um, operation, including one that's exciting to me is we're kicking off a study of our downtown mobility structure. And one of our targets as we go public transit is to develop transit priority corridors through downtown Nashville. Um, you've been here on business, you've been here as a visitor and tourist, and you know, trying to get through that lower Broadway area in downtown Nashville on a Saturday night is a slow crawl um, for some people on all fours. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But certainly for our buses, we've clocked recently, I mean, this is during the pandemic, recently it's taken our buses half an hour to get through downtown Nashville on a Saturday night. So identifying those options, um, we're looking at a secondary, the facility you're in, which is our main downtown transit hub, 24 bus bays during normal, uh, when we're at full operation, about 2,200 bus movements a day, about 15 to 18,000 people a day coming through the building. It's kind of busting at the seams. So we're looking at developing a secondary downtown hub south of Broadway. Okay. So essentially having a dual hub system out of the downtown core and then looking at how we connect those. Um, recently, we were very excited. Um, Amazon um, identified Nashville. We, we got the consolation prize in their H to HQ2 okay. competition. So we are going to be the location of the Amazon Operations Center of Excellence. Um, they have just finished the first building on their campus. They're, they are, have started construction on the second. They expect to have 5,000 employees in downtown Nashville within the next five years. 
part of what they announced was um, they're putting a significant amount of money and effort into the connection between transit and affordable housing. So we're working closely with the city, with Amazon, with our development community to integrate affordable and workforce housing um, into our transit system, into some of the tr neighborhood transit centers I talked about. One of, the, one of the projects we're working on is a transit center, kind of in one of our outlying neighborhoods um, that serves as a focal point for what we hope will be a future bus rapid transit corridor. And the developer of that land, about 80 acres, is working with us and some housing developers to incorporate that center into, you know, a much broader development that includes affordable and workforce housing. That's great. You, and I know we're going to dig into this in, in detail with everyone, but I just want to take a, a step outside of this conversation and talk about you for a second. Uh -oh. uh, you've got a great background, Steve, and, and are considered one of the top leaders in our industry. I remember seeing you speak at a conference a few years ago here in Nashville and just being impressed with, with you as a leader. That's actually right after that when you and I got to know each other a little bit better. Tell us about your background and career, how long you've been sure. here, and even how that you've, you've, I don't want to say spun out leaders, that's not the right way to say <laughs> it, but, uh, but you've had several really high profile people. My good friend, Julie Tim, you know, yep. who I just talked to this week from Richmond came from here and she says a lot of what she learned, she learned right here working with you. Oh, well then look out Richmond. <laughs> uh, you, you may have some trouble with Julie. Yeah. I, I think it's frankly, when I look back at my, uh, my professional career, people say, what are you most proud of? And I am proud of a lot of the people that I've worked with who've gone on to, you know, bigger and better things. Um, Julie's a great example. India Birdsong is killing it in Cleveland. Yes. Um, you know, both of them tremendous leaders, um, frankly, with tremendous hearts. Uh, and I look at folks like them. And, and you're going to be meeting a few of the next generation. So when people say, you know, how do you, how do you um, generate that much leadership in the industry? I say, well, you know, they all seem to be in a hurry to get away from me. So, <laughs> so that's an important piece of motivation. But I would say that one of the things I do, and, and I think you'll see it when you talk to our folks later today, is try to give people a broad, especially once they demonstrate their competence and, frankly, their compassion and that they they buy into what we're doing as a business. Yes. Um, give them a wide berth and see where they go with it, you know. And I'm looking around the room yeah. at the people you'll be talking to. Dan Freudberg. We just promoted to our Deputy Chief Operations Officer for Systems. Dan. Dan. Um, Dan came out of the, the bus operator ranks, um, has college degrees, is very, you know, very well accomplished in that area, but just dives into technology and innovation. So pretty much when there's a project that we can't solve, we give it to Dan and he and his team figure out how to solve it. Um, Trey Walker came over to us as an engineer. Actually, Julie hired Trey. I was skeptical about the guy, frankly, when I interviewed him, but Julie hired Trey when she was here as, as an engineer. He moved up through chief engineers, now our chief development officer, and is actually developing. You know, when I came to Nashville, we were pretty much a bus operating agency. So Trey has really kind of built out um, our ability to create design, construction, project development as a core competency. Um, to the level, in fact, where the city, the new city DOT is frankly entrusting a lot of those types of projects with us, you know, as opposed to trying to do them independently. That's great. Um, you'll be talking to Nick Oldham, our senior safety manager, who is on track to become our chief safety officer. Nick's another guy, came in as bus operator, promoted up through, became a trainer, um, just has a passion for it. So when folks can demonstrate to us, to me, that they have a passion, they have a level of ability, they have a willingness to learn, um, I guess the term giving them enough rope to hang themselves uh, would apply. And in almost all cases, um, they've taken the rope and they've made more rope. That's great. Yeah. Giving people another analogy might be, you know, letting them spread their wings. So many CEOs. That's probably better. Yeah. So many, so many <laughs> CEOs that I've met uh, are... I want to say insecure, and they try to micromanage uh, their team. But I have found the ones that have the greatest success are able to uh, bring around them a great team of people to support them, and then they let them spread their wings. And then you've got instead of one person, right. you know, lifting the agency, you've got seven or eight or ten top managers. Right. That sounds like what you've done here. I can't wait to meet everyone. Yeah, um, I think you'll be uh, certainly the the quality of the interview will go up <laughs> after you get away from me and onto <laughs> onto a lot of other folks. But no, there's a, there are a lot of exciting things going on. Obviously, you know, pause with the pandemic pandemic and all of the concerns there, um, you know, taking care of our folks, our employees, certainly trying to keep our riders as safe as possible, trying to reassure, you know, the community. But I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm super optimistic. I mentioned earlier, 
talk about, you know, you're talking about the New York Times, the death of public transit. So star ridership still way down because our office workers right. in downtown Nashville just aren't here. On the other hand, we also use the star very effectively for some of the major special events here in Nashville. Um, Fourth of July fireworks, full trains, like completely full trains. Nashville just had its first ever a few weeks back Grand Prix um, IndyCar race downtown. Um, train was half to two thirds full. So people will use it. You know, people are not, quote, afraid to come back to transit, but they have to have a reason to come back to transit. And what we're seeing in Nashville is absolutely uh, one of our MTA board members that works in the commercial real estate market here in town. What she's hearing from her clients is definitely people are going to be going to flexible work schedules and maybe they're in the office three days a week and home two days a week. You know, and on the one hand, that's ooh, that that kind of points to a large ridership drop. On the other hand, the level of job growth here in the, in the region as a whole and in the downtown core suggests to me that um, transit is going to become an increasingly important way that people get around. Because, again, our street network is limited. It's a radial network. Everything kind of points into the downtown core. And in contrast, you know, with cities, I was just in Birmingham a few weeks back, Indianapolis recently. Um, those are cities doing some tremendous things. They have really wide streets to play yeah, with. Yeah, Indianapolis does. Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Birmingham does. Birmingham's okay. doing a terrific uh, BRT project. Now it's down there and the streets are super wide. We're here. Yeah, not so If much, we're lucky, uh, it's two or three lanes. Yeah. So, you know, we really have some strategic decisions to make with the city and our downtown community about how we allocate that space. Yeah, and the role of transit now becoming more than just mass transit for commuters, but really creating a mobility network, right, for yeah. the entire community to make sure we don't leave anyone, anyone behind. Our goal, one of the projects we're most excited about right now is we're developing our North Nashville um, Neighborhood Transit Center. It's in a traditional minority neighborhood. It's one of the low, lowest income neighborhoods, um, na one of the lowest income neighborhoods in the city and has the highest percentage of zero auto Households. Wow. Um, we have a significant amount of service concentrated up there. We have a significant amount of ridership concentrated up there. So building this neighborhood transit center will bring six bus routes together where people can make connections without having to go through town, without having to go through the downtown transit terminal here. So we can tax that facility less. And when we did the calculations, we estimated that within a 45 minute to 60 minute tra average transit commute, the number of jobs that will be accessible to people in that neighborhood will expand by over 100,000 with the creation of the transit center and the service improvements we're doing. And it's become a partnership with that neighborhood actually in design. You know, so we expect to be incorporating some of the cultural and historical elements of the city into the project, you know, through collaboration uh, with that neighborhood and the folks who live there. That's great. Steve Land, thanks so much for being with us today and, Thank you, Paul. and introducing your team to us. I can't wait yes. to dive in even more and to see how things are going. We wish you the very best as you continue to grow the system. The highlights of the interview are yet to come. <laughs> Now we're with Nick Oldham, who is a senior safety officer here. What's your full title, Nick? Senior safety program manager. Program manager, yeah. Here at Nashville MTA, we go transportation. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. This is our first ever uh, video podcast. Okay. And uh, next to Steve, you're our first guest. All right. <laughs> Tell us a little about your role and what you've been doing. Sure thing. Uh, so I, I originally was hired to, um, you know, as the FTA was kind of pushing out uh, some regulations on safety management systems. That's what I was originally hired for. So I started March 1st, uh, and then March 3rd, we had a tornado come through uh, Nashville. And so I kind of adjusted and stopped talking about SMS stuff and, and trying to figure out how to route through uh, um, down power, power lines and trees. And then March 5th was our first case of COVID-19 in the state of Tennessee. Uh, and so it was like, hey, Nick, head down to the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, we've got some stuff down there for you to do. And so I'm sitting in the room like a deer and, you know, caught in headlights like, uh, yeah, so Nick, what, what is MDA doing? Uh, let's figure that out. Uh, so it kind of shifted to making sure that, you know, as I was following Steve's leadership, you know, he was really all about making sure that we kept our employees whole and that we did everything that we could to make sure that our passengers you know, had a safe ride because we really were essential to, 
you know, as COVID was kind of picking up and hospitals were uh, getting crowded, you know, those employees that were working at the hospitals relied on our public transportation in order to get there. Uh, so we really felt like we were a central part of keeping, you know, everybody whole as the pandemic increased. So it kind of shifted from keeping, you know, looking at bus accidents to really how do we keep people alive? Yeah. And how did you? What's What's been your uh, game plan that you've that you've accomplished. Sure. So the first thing that I, I thought important to do is we got a hold of the director of public health um, and had them actually come to our facility and view how we're uh, cleaning buses and our disinfecting practices, and then had them give us some recommendations. What can we do more of? What should we do less of? And we took their recommendations and really kind of uh, looked at external, like how do we keep our passengers safe? So you know, we closed cross-contamination areas. We in, uh, installed uh, hand sanitation stations. Um, you know, we enhanced our disinfecting practices. And then we start looking internally. What can we do to make sure that our passengers or our employees are safe? Uh, so we got them proper PPE. We installed barriers and, you know, it created a work-from-home schedule and made sure that everybody was whole. That's great. And, and what's the results been? The result has been great. Um, you know, I think by and large, all of our employees feel like we were doing what we can. You know, we we created a, a COVID call where we got all the leadership on a call every week to make sure that cross departments, you know, we were all communicating and doing what was best. And I think that is what created the synergy for all of us to make sure that we felt like we were doing everything that we could to keep everybody safe. That's good. Yeah, and I think it's helped also some of these studies coming out of Great Britain and other places showing that it's very difficult. Transmission is not happening on the stanchions or the seats hardly at all. Absolutely. And the, everybody's got their masks on on the bus. And so it actually, uh, transit may turn out to be one of the safer places. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, we've had no cases uh, that I'm aware of. And I talked to public health just a, a week ago. Um, that no cases have been tied to our public transit. Really? Yeah. Wow, that is amazing, Nick. Yeah. So what do you? So now that the Delta variant is kind of coming through and all that, sure. what do you, what what are you projecting going forward? Are, do you have any changes you're going to do? Or are you going to just kind of stick with the program because it's worked? Yeah, we're sticking with it, but we're also uh, we just contracted a a, consul a consultant uh, to come in. Uh, TDS and Associates is coming in. Uh, they're doing uh, uh, you know biopathogen protocols for us, biosafety protocols. Uh, they're going to be testing our actual facilities for COVID-19, uh, both, you know, the, the original uh, virus and the Delta variant. Uh, we're, we're getting information that there is another one that's, you know, kind of popped up in Houston and making its way here. So they're going to be, you know, kind of creating a, a, a protocol for us and making sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep that variant in a, in a suppressed state here within our ranks. Very good. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Now we're on to the next phase of our interview here with folks, uh, some of the leaders of Nashville MTA, the WeGo bus system. And I'm with Felix Castrodad and Katie Freudberg who work here. Thank you so much for being on our first ever video and audio podcast. This is exciting. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to be here in Music City, right? One of the best cities in the country. Um, so Felix, tell us about wh what your job is and what you do. Sure. Uh, I'm Director of Planning and Grants. Uh, so we look at the planning of a system, long-term planning. We, uh, one of the main things that we do is the development of our strategic plan in motion. Uh, and then we work very closely with uh, Kitty and other departments with the service planning and uh, also managing, applying for grants, managing grants, uh, and uh, with the development department that we're part of in implementation of the capital plan as well. And how long have you been in this position? Uh, about seven and a half years now. Very good. So tell us about the recent plan you undertook, and then we'll talk to Katie about actually implementing it. Sure. So uh, Better Buzz is basically, uh, I'll start by saying it's a product of our strategic plan in motion that was completed in 2016. Uh, and motion identified a series of strategies for making uh, service better, transit service better in Nashville over the next uh, several years. Uh, but one of those strategies was to uh, make what we have, uh, you know, the existing service better. And we heard loud and clear during that process that people wanted to make sure that we start by making what we have better because it can be better. Um, so that's where Better Boss comes in. And it's a five-year plan, basically, uh, to be able to make transit better, uh, not only to improve the quality of uh, service, but also to make sure that we are catering and the system is still relevant and addressing some of the needs uh, that the riders have and, and uh, just to make sure that we are connecting those dots. 
Uh, did you follow like the Houston model where they you did all this analysis, heat maps and all that stuff to see where people want to go and then you're adjusting routes? It, it's, it's, it's a bit of that. It's a comprehensive look at our system. Uh, and yes, we do uh, what we did look at what other systems are, are doing just because uh, our, our Houston was kind of like, you know, very quickly implemented. Yes. Ours is just taking a phase approach uh, to okay. that. Right. Not overnight. Uh, it's not overnight. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, we're not quite at that point. But uh, one of the things that is important about it is, that, as you may be aware, Nashville is growing. It's growing a lot and it's growing very rapidly. So what we're seeing is that many of our routes have been in place for decades. And except for some minor tweaks and changes that we've done over the years, they may not be responding to what the current context is. Yes. Uh, and so the neighborhoods are changing. The people are moving. Jobs are coming to other places. And we have to make sure that we are connecting those dots, that we are uh, improving the access to those access to jobs, access to education, to food. Uh, how is our system being more responsive? I think in light of the pandemic, we know that ridership is not the main indicator, but access is going to be a key. So I think Better Bus is going to help us to better address uh, some of those needs. That's awesome. Glad to hear you say that because I'm a strong believer in that. Ridership is not the only KPI that matters. And I think the pandemic has shown that, right? We still have a critical role in providing mobility for cities, even if we're not at you know 100% of the ridership before, which was largely commuter driven in many cities. So great. Let's push this down to Katie a little bit off of what you do and how you started to implement these changes that were laid out in the plan. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Katie Freudberg. I'm the scheduling and service planning manager. Um, so our department kind of takes the, the master plan as well as um, any short term changes that are needed due to traffic or ridership changes or changing street conditions. Um, and traditionally, we've implemented those on a biannual basis. Um, over the last year and a half, we've had uh, quite a few markups. I, I think I might change my terms of employment to get paid by the markup. <laughs> um, can retire early. Um, so um, I guess over the, over the last year and a half, while we've been working on the Better Bus Plan, we've also been kind of scrambling to change service to, to meet changing conditions, to meet um, you know, the, the safety needs that Nick's been talking about um, while still meeting rider needs. That's great. Now, when you uh, when you put together these new route plans, is Nick or the safety team involved to kind of analyze where the routes will be, the turning radius and all that stuff? Yeah, so it's definitely a cooperative effort between uh, the safety department, operations, planning, uh, making sure that really everybody's taking a look at it and making sure that it's a sustainable, sustainable plan that we're putting out. One of the problems that I've, you know, I've done transit now for 34 years now, and uh, in, when I was in senior roles like CEO of the MTA in Baltimore, Every week, I would get a call from some elected official, a city councilman or whatever, saying, hey, Paul, can you put a bus stop here? Or, hey, Paul, can you move a bus stop out of here? Or all these requests. And so I could see how our routes ended up looking like Spaghetti Street, right? Over 10, 20, 30 years, you end up with zigzags. Are you trying to straighten things out, make things more efficient, and set in place certain standards so you can tell the politician, I'm sorry, sir, uh, you know, we could do an analysis of that for you, but... If it doesn't fit, you know, 10 passengers per hour or whatever, we're not going to be able to put a bus stop there because it'll slow the whole thing down. That is absolutely something we've been trying to do. <laughs> okay. um, and actually, in a way, COVID has helped with that because we've gotten a chance to step back a little bit, reduce service and start out with a little more of a blank slate and really focus on what customers are looking for. Um, what we've seen throughout this is that on our major corridors, that's where people are. Um, you know, job access, that early morning service, those essential jobs um, barely slowed down for us during the pandemic. Um, so it's kind of given us a chance to take some of the, the, the low hanging fruit that maybe would have previously been a, a whole political to do. Yeah. Um, there's literally no demand for it right now. So we get a chance to step back and say these resources would really make the most sense to go to where we have the most riders, the most need, where it really provides access to jobs. And what, what we have seen is that that perfectly aligns with some of the principles of uh, Better Bus. Uh, we're looking at to improve the frequency uh, over time. Um, we have those major corridors making sure that the buses come more often, and that's where we're seeing some of that ridership uh, growing. Uh, a span of hours of operations. Nashville is an entertainment city. We're going to have buses coming earlier, later, the problem we have is that we can take people to work in those venues and those events. By the time they get out, they, there's no bus service for them to come back. Right. So that's one of the things that we're focusing in. Uh, we're making sure that we're decentralizing our system, which is a uh, radial system uh, with more cross-town routes, uh, transit centers out, outside so people don't have to travel to downtown all the time. Uh, and also improving um, 
that, that mix of new models connecting fixed route and uh, micro transit, uh, mobility on demand, in those areas that lower density where uh, it's probably not cost efficient to have a fixed route. Uh, and, and start, we're going to start a pilot soon. Very good. Felix and Katie, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us how you're implementing the plan, even post COVID, actually making probably routes more relevant now than ever, huh? That's all right. All right. Thank you. On to the next phase of our interview here on our first ever video and audio Transit Unplugged podcast. You guys are going to be famous all over the world after this. Thanks so much for being with us here in Nashville, Music City. What a great place to start out. Trey, tell us about uh, your job and what you do and some of the cool things you've got going on right now. My name's Trey Walker. I'm the Chief Development Officer for WeGo Public Transit. I oversee our facilities group, which includes uh, all of our roadside facilities as well as our fixed uh, building facilities. So I'd like say it's the small roofs and the big roofs. Um, and then uh, with that is our engineering construction group, which Lydia is a project manager with them. Um, and then on the side, uh, we also oversee our planning and service development group, which you've talked to Felix and, and Katie, the real brains behind that operation. So. Great. And Lydia, tell us about yourself and what you do. So I uh, work with Trey and as a project manager for engineering and construction. So I'm often the one that's managing these projects and uh, capital projects and the small and large projects. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the transit systems that are most attuned to what the riders want, it's really a lot of small changes and small improvements that make the system better. And you've got a bunch of stuff going on right now, Trey, that, is, that I think is super interesting. Uh, and I think it will be for our listeners too. Tell us kind of the big picture of what you got going on here. Yeah, of course. So uh, last year, our city adopted a um, transportation plan. So there's a national transportation plan. And within it is a lot of the principles that you talked to with Felix and Katie about. The uh, adoption of our Better Bus program and that phased approach for that. And with that, we understand that there's some physical assets that come along with that and improving access to stops, uh, the quality of our stops, um, and the amenities that are at those locations. And as part of that plan, we've got about 95 locations um, to improve our stop amenities, uh, whether it be an existing sheltered stop that's currently undersized and we want to expand and expand access to crosswalks and expand access to the sidewalk network that we have, or a site that has uh, meets our guidelines for a new sheltered stop that we want to install a shelter there. And a lot of what we have here in Nashville is uh, we were talking earlier about a constrained right-of-way and um, real tight roads trying to do a lot within a little bit of area. Um, and so these projects are not just taking our crew out and bolting down a shelter or a sidewalk. These are sidewalk projects. These are very much civil engineering type projects where we're incorporating road drainage, um, sidewalk construction, um, and planning along a corridor, as well as just at an ind- ind- or as well as determinate locations. Tell me about that bike thing where you're lifting lanes or something. Yeah, uh, so we've recently, uh, so we've got the 95 stops that we'll be working on in the future, but we just completed our Nolensville stop uh, improvement project. Nolensville Pike is our third highest ridership route um, and was really due for some physical improvements to the stop uh, quality. And so along that road, we improved 18 bus stops over the last year. Lydia was the project manager and can go into some details, but one of the tool, uh, tools we were able to put in our tool belt and working with the state DOT and the city DOT we have incorporated a bike lane concept where the bike lane raises to the curb elevation at the stop, um, holds flat along with the curb and sidewalk elevation through the duration of the stop, so about 60 feet or so, and then ramps back down to the bike lane elevation uh, on the far side of the stop location uh, so that we're able to um, operate more safely, more efficiently by staying in the travel lane. And then we're also able to utilize more of that right of way for shared use, which is both transit, pedestrian, and cycle access. What kind of challenges did you face when you were implementing these big projects or, and you're starting to continue to do some, it sounds like? Well, I think some of the first challenges uh, that we faced was just cooperating with um, the Nashville Department of Transportation yes. and the Trans- uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation, making sure that we were all on the same board, uh, on the same plan, and we went through several meetings collaborating with them on the design the Nolensville project in particular had five different design concepts incorporated on the corridor, and those included just your regular sidewalk stop. It also included um, the raised cycle track stop that Trey talked about, and um, a bus bulb, which extends the sidewalk out toward the travel lane, kind of taking up some of on-street parking, and a bus island, which we incorporated at the zoo, um, which has the bike lane going in between um, the sidewalk and the bus island, which we have boarding and alighting areas, so the bike lane stays in the same elevation as the street at that uh, design concept. 
And then we had extended boarding platforms that we incorporated uh, large custom shelters at Nolensville near Welshwood, one of our largest stops. That's interesting. Nick, has this helped in safety? Uh, <clears throat> Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we, you know, saw pretty, uh, pretty quickly was, you know, that when our buses pull off to a stop, you know, they have a really hard time merging back into to traffic. And there's been some accidents there. So having this concept there really improves safety, not only for our, our you know, the people that are driving, but for our, our drivers not having to worry about merging back into oncoming traffic. Um, and then there, there were times where we saw where our bus operators were pulling out from a stop to make a turn and cars would come around on the right side of that bus. And so this concept really helps to prevent that from happening. That's great. And um, Lydia, I was going to ask you, uh, you mentioned that there were certain standards that bus shelters, you know, a, a, maybe a stop versus a shelter, small shelter versus a big shelter. Tell me some about that and how that comes into play. Are you doing an analysis of foot traffic? How are you doing that? Those kind of things. Let's get into the, play some inside baseball here. <laughs> well, um, the, the primary standards that we're concerned about is uh, complying with ADA pro -WAG standards in, okay. in the right of way. So we wanted to make sure that we have a five by eight boarding area. Um, and the shared cycle track in particular helps us to accommodate our transit riders as well as the bicyclist lane and meets ADA parameters, as well as um, the constraints of the right-of-way. So it really helps us in many ways. And in our conversations with TDOT, um, they actually are incorporating a form of that raised cycle track or shared cycle track, as it's called at some time, um, in their new bus stop uh, design standards. And so they will be available, once that is vetted and, and approved, it will be available for any any transit agency in the state of Tennessee. That's great. And Trey, last question is, how are you paying for all this? Are you getting some of that new money from Washington coming down to help you with this, or what's happening there? So a lot of the projects that we're talking about being constructed, we actually um, have a little bit of a, a grant funding uh, cocktail of sorts. Not not necessarily the, the COVID dollars uh, okay. for these projects, but um, some of our federal $5307, we actually were awarded some uh, money from the state's Improved Act. Uh, a couple uh, a couple cycles ago that we utilized for the Nolensville project. And then we have some local uh, grant money as well. So, so we kind of have a cocktail for those improvements. And then moving forward, uh, we'll look to do the same thing where we can leverage some of our local money that's coming through our CSP program and Nashville's dedication to uh, delivering their transportation plan um, and leverage that with some of the federal and state dollars and funding opportunities that we have coming down. Great. Anything else that you want to share with us about what's, go what's coming in the future? Uh, we mentioned it earlier, but um, the transit uh, centers that we're working on right now, we've got two uh, that are in active development and we're also, you know, always got some hooks in the line looking for, for some new opportunities. And, and we definitely have some of those out there on the horizon. But the two we're working on right now, uh, we have one being constructed as our Hillsborough Transit Center, which is an end of line for uh, one of our frequent transit network site, uh, routes, as along with a neighborhood circulator that's going to come through that as well. Um, and then we have the North Nashville Transit Center. Uh, which is actively in design right now, which will get up to six routes coming into to one location. Um, all told, the Hillsborough Center, we're looking to uh, be operational by uh, the early 2022. Um, and then North Nashville, it's, it's actively in construction. And then North Nashville will be coming online uh, in 2023. Excellent. Well, thank you. for This is a great in-depth look at what's happening and some key projects to improve mobility in the city and the area around surrounding Nashville. Thank you. Thanks. On to the next hot topic here in our first ever video and audio podcast, and that is transit signal priority and headway management. Two of the latest big trends over the last five years that have rolled across America when it comes to transit systems. I know we were just talking beforehand. These are two of the things we did in Baltimore uh, and uh, to some degree of success, I would say. So Lydia, uh, Benda, tell us a little about yourself and your role in the TSP project. Thank you, Paul, for having us. So uh, my name is Lydia Benda. I, I work at WeGo as a project manager and uh, in, in engineering and construction. So one of the major projects that I've been just working on, just finished up, is the Murfreesboro Transit Signal Priority Project. Um, so we just completed that project in cooperation with Nashville uh, Department of Transportation with funding from the Federal Transit Authority. In the spring of 2021, we just finished this project. It's a, a project that incorporates 11 miles of corridor on the Murfreesboro and Bell Road corridor. Um, and Murfreesboro Pike, our route 
55 is our highest ridership with over 2,400 riders as of June 2021. Um, so the project incorporated 11 miles of roadway, 42 signals, um, 23 upgraded transit stops with real-time signage. Um, it in included fiber on the entire corridor and a centralized traffic management system an upgraded CAD AVL on 20, uh, on the entire fleet. So it, it sets us up for being able to expand TSP to other corridors. And so we're really excited about that. Tell us about the results. Have you seen any improvement in the efficiency of the routes and the timeliness of them? We have seen some differences, but we really need to gather more data. The project has just finished up. Um, okay. So just been implemented. We really need more data. So in the transit signal priority, tell us uh, which style you went to. Did you go to the one that, um, you know, so the bus is coming up, it sends out a signal, and then what happens? Does it hold it green longer or make it turn green faster? Is that the idea? Right. The, this project um, incorporates, it's called a geofence level uh, um, way of yeah. doing things. And so the bus approaches an intersection and it's a conditional priority. So if it is two minutes or more behind schedule, it will send a request through the CAD AVL system to the centralized management, uh, traffic management system. Of the city, right? Of the city. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That will send a message out to that next traffic signal. And if there is an opportunity, it will extend the green time um, to provide more green time for the bus to go through the intersection. The project also includes five Q-jump locations. And um, at these locations, it, it always gets a, a traffic signal, a transit signal. It has its own unique transit signal at these locations to allow the bus to jump ahead and um, proceed through the intersection ahead of the red light waiting traffic. Yeah. Well, obviously, this is a city making a priority decision, right? We're going to prioritize buses over regular traffic, and we want people who are riding buses to feel like uh, it's getting them faster than if they walked. How does that affect safety? You know, we always try to look through everything through the prism of safety first. Sure. Moving to TSP for a city, how, tell us how that interacts with safety. You know, one of the one of the things that we did uh, was we created a safety app where our drivers could tell us where the problem spots and stuff were so that we could kind of coordinate with the different other departments to say, hey, how can we make this better? Uh, so definitely from a standpoint of, you know, when we, we're talking about one of our largest, our largest corridor. Yeah, the number one route. The number yeah. one route. Of course, there's congestion and, and stuff, and so accidents are bound to happen. Well, with these buses being able to get through uh, the signal, you know, hold the signal or, you know, change it. I think by and large, when, when drivers feel that they're in tight spots and, you know, they get a, a bit nervous or something, they're pro more prone to accidents. That's right. And so allowing this, allowing them to pass through kind of cuts down on that. I talk to the operators all the time and they're saying they love it oh, and they're pleased by it. That's yeah. wonderful. All right, Dan, tell us about yourself, what your job is. And uh, we, I'd be interested to find out a little bit more about the headway management system which in a lot of cities is coordinated with TSP. It's kind of done at the same time. So, That's right. So I'm Dan Freuberg. I'm the uh, Deputy Chief Operating Officer here at WeGo. And uh, yes, that's, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can uh, really build upon the project that Lydia just spoke about on our Murfreesboro Road Corridor, the partnership that we already have with the Nashville Department of Transportation, and the investments that we've already made in the um, you know, transit signal system and our CAD AVL system as well. Uh, to kind of take this to the next level. So what we're looking at doing uh, on our Charlotte Pike corridor is uh, something a little bit different. So Lydia mentioned that we have conditional priority for buses where if they're more than two minutes late, then they issue a priority request. So on, on this corridor, we're actually going to be looking at doing conditional priority, but based on vehicle headways. So if you've got two buses that are, say, they're supposed to be 10 minutes apart, but they're 15 minutes apart, regardless of whether they're on schedule or not, uh, that bus that's lagging the, the leader will receive uh, priority in terms of green extension or early green along the corridor to help them catch up. And that's really critical in maintaining reliable service on a frequent transit corridor uh, because the further that bus gets behind, the more likely it is to fall further behind. And any bus operator will tell you, you start to get more passengers and it just becomes a challenge. So this is one tool that tries to give that vehicle a, a leg up. And we're also going to be doing that in combination with giving our 
bus operators and our operations supervisors better information and decision-making tools to be able to proactively manage the spacing of those vehicles. So we think that in combination with the TSP will, will uh, deliver some pretty promising results. But again, it's, it's really early for us, but it's something we're really excited to be working with the city on. I talked to the folks at the Visa credit card uh, company a couple years ago. They did a survey. One of the key reasons why people don't like riding transit is because it's not reliable. Uh, and they can't count on it being there when it's supposed to be there. Uh, moving away from needing a schedule and having a bus come uh, on a high frequency route, like you've got a couple of them that are on 10 minute headways. How have you seen that impact of passengers? Are they pleased with that? Yeah, one of the things that's really helped with that is the ability to provide real-time information and the same technology that's providing that real-time information to customers through smartphone apps or through on-street signage is the technology that's enabling us to do these uh, innovations on, on signal priority. Um, now, and we're, we've really just recently as a city and as an agency started to move towards these 15 and 10 minute headways. So for us, it's also going to be kind of a culture shift for, for our operators and for our operations department as a whole and for our customers to some degree who they've traditionally, you know, been, you know, they, they catch the 1010 bus or they catch the 1040 bus. Now we want to make it as convenient as possible. You know, a bus is going to show up every 10 minutes, regardless of what's going on. And that's all you need to worry about. And here's an app where you can see exactly where that bus is. Dan, tell us about the latest project you've got going on called We Go Link. Yeah, we've got an exciting project, and then what this what We Go Link really is it's a first and last mile connection service, uh, connecting customers in an area that traditionally is really difficult to serve with with fixed route, uh, low to medium density, not a great you know connected street network. Trying to connect those individuals to one of our frequent transit lines, uh, in this case, the uh, uh, Murfreesboro Road corridor, which is also the same corridor we have signal priority That's on. That's what we were just talking yep. about. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So we've got a very good level of fixed route service there, but not everybody can get to it because of maybe disability, walking distance, sidewalk infrastructure, you okay. name it. So uh, we are partnering with uh, Uber and also with one of our third party paratransit providers to provide on-demand service in a predefined service area around a couple of transfer locations on this frequent transit corridor. And so the, they don't have to call a day ahead or seven days ahead like ADA traditional? Exactly. Okay. Now they can, if they want, they can pre-schedule, okay. but they can also just go on demand when, when they'd like to. And in a few, few minutes, there will be a vehicle available for them. And the, basically the only, you have to take a trip within the service area and as long as it starts or ends at one of these two transfer locations, then we'll essentially subsidize the cost of the trip to make it affordable for people. So for most of the trips that people will take within the service program, uh, the cost would be about $2 or about the same as, uh, as a fixed route uh, wow. there. That's not bad. And what's the maximum length somebody might ride? A couple miles to get to or from where they live to one of these transfer stations? Yeah, maybe maybe three or four miles. We've, we're actually in a beta test right now for the program, and the average trip length is between one and two miles. So pretty short, but you know, just ex making literally that last mile connection. Yeah, that's awesome. That, as we were talking about beforehand, microtransit to me is probably one of the top three trends happening in America right now as people are looking to do just what you're talking about. Basically to say, it's not just about fixed route service. It's about mobility. And some people can't get to the fixed route. So that's what you're trying to do, right? That's right. And you know, a lot of, a lot of agencies struggle with the frequency versus coverage. How do we yes. allocate our resources appropriately? And so we find this to be a really good balance where, where we know it just wouldn't be productive to run our fixed route, but we, but we can actually increase the productivity of our core transit services by providing these coverage tools and, you know, technology and, uh, you know, new service modes really enable us to do that now. What is success going to look like for you? How will you know if you want to continue it or expand it? So we'll be looking at things like utilization. Uh, we'll be looking at, you know, travel times and responsiveness. One of the things that we want to make sure is that this service is also um, accessible and equitable to customers that maybe are paying with cash or using wheelchairs. And that's where our third-party provider comes in. So we'll be looking at service equivalency between those two uh, service providers. And then we'll also be looking at customer satisfaction. We'll be issuing surveys and that kind of thing. And, of course, cost. We want to make sure we're trying to stay relatively in range with what our cost per passenger is on fixed route. It can be a little bit higher because we know it's point-to-point -point, yes. uh, trip, but but we want to stay within that within that area. 
one of the you know things that we're looking towards as a future is better integrated fair uh, fair connectivity with with you know and payment payment options. So we've got our quick ticket account based fair fair collection system that we're getting ready to roll out. Not integrated with our WeGo Link pilot yet, okay. but you know if that becomes a permanent service offering, that's something we might be looking at for the future as well. It's excellent. I'm very impressed how you're. It's like. Uh, on all points, you're moving forward. I mean, this, this to me is the message of today is that you're not just doing one or two things. It's like at every area of service, you're trying to make improvements. You're making sure it's safe, uh, but you're also improving the efficiency and the reliability and the customer service of the system. And to me, those are the four points that make a great transit system, right? You safe, efficient, reliable, world-class customer service. And it sounds like you're pushing forward on all four fronts. That's what we're heading for. That's awesome. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's awesome, man. It's a bus system of the future. That's great. And Lydia, thanks so much for being with us today. And now finally, to wrap it all up, MTA's resident storyteller. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Renuka, Christoph, uh, thank you so much for being with us and kind of wrapping all this up. Today we've been talking about all the um, integrated parts of a transit system and how you make iterative improvements. Tell us about yourself and your role here now. Okay. So I am the Director of Marketing, Communications, and Sales. So what that means is I oversee all internal and external communications as well as promotion of WeGo. In, in a nutshell. So um, what I love about being here, I've been in different industries, um, ranging from healthcare to hospitality. And um, I guess I'm putting in a personal note here. I love being in public transit and especially at this time in Nashville, because um, as we grow, we're, you know, just known as a hot city to live in the quote unquote it city. Right. Um, you know, we could continue to get an influx of people, population growth. And with that, public transportation is definitely the most sustainable and affordable solution. So, I mean, just from a personal standpoint, yeah, I'm just yeah. passionate about it. Something that I think is important is to tell our story. Yes. And so what I like to do is um, first and foremost, share what we have done, what we are doing and what we are going to do. Uh, so we've created a project report called We Kept Rolling, which is going to be available on our website. And that covers all of the phenomenal work that my team has done. Um, I, I, I work with some of the most brilliant minds I ever have. So that showcases the, the work that's been done. Um, and through all of that, how we've maintained our safety regulations and, um, again, just sanitizing, disinfecting high touch points and just really staying on top of all of that. Um and then in terms of things that are currently happening, I think the team has well covered all the things that we're currently yeah. doing. Um, and then with what's coming up, um, I think among the things that Dan touched on are quick ticket, which is going to be us doing away with paper and going digital. So getting that means, um, you know, you can utilize your app or a reloadable car to quickly get on the bus. And so, of course, getting on the bus quicker means that buses can get to the locations they need to get to quicker. Absolutely. So it's fun things like that that I get to tell our community about. Tell us about some of what you're doing. How are you doing the messaging? I heard recently you may have had him on the front page of the newspaper or something uh, like yeah. that well, I've telling got, a story. So, kind yeah, of human so interest side of something I'm like that. actually personal agent to Nick Oldham <laughs> and Patrick Hester, who's not here today. Um, I'm in my humble background. So what I did is, so we're, we are doing a big now hiring campaign where we're hiring for bus operators. PTW yeah. side note, if you're looking to move to the It City, we're hiring bus operators. So please apply. So a big initiative we've been pushing is your success is our success. So we had Nick and Patrick interviewed on two local radio stations. Um, and we also got some phenomenal coverage in the uh, Nashville Daily, the Tennessean, mm -hmm. talking about uh, all of that and, and not just our hiring, but also current campaigns. One of our campaigns we're doing, it's called uh, Roll with WeGo. And we we commissioned to a cartoonist to create an original cartoon for us, Lee Rubin. He's the guy, he's a nationally syndicated cartoonist who's oh, done wow. the cow cartoons. So um, we've got animals that are in face masks on the bus and there's a an animal knitting, one is reading, one is sleeping. And so the hashtag is to... Um, well, basically, tell us how you hashtag roll with WeGo. Okay. So that, that's a, a fun side yeah. campaign, um, promoting that on social media, just to engage um, riders and non-riders and letting them know who we are. Um, and then in terms of additional messaging, again, it's back to projects that we're going to be doing. So we're getting ready for that in terms okay. of Quick Ticket and WeGo Link. We're getting ready to launch some really fun campaigns for that. 
And I want to touch on one other thing. Okay, when, sure. you, when you talked about seeing local gems, another thing that I, a mindset I'd like to take for us is not just to get people on the bus, but to get non-riders to think of taking public transportation because of showcasing to them, hey, you want to go here to here? Well, take public transportation to get from here to here. Uh, for example, thinking about partnering with a local mall and do a shop and hop campaign where shop at the mall, hop on this bus route and get to this popular destination. Yeah. And the point is, is to get people on the bus to at least go there one way. If they decide right. to come back a different way, fine. So, so you'd um, highlight like, a popular destination, the Ryman Theater, you can get there by, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Or the yeah. George Jones Museum. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Did you know this hidden gem was here on this street? Yes. Yeah. And so again, letting locals know, hey, you take a staycation, utilize WeGo, you know, family there day. There you go. Uh, parents with young kids, hop on the bus and uh, here to get to the zoo, from the zoo, go here to eat, and you got a fun day. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing, what I think is very cool about public transportation is it targets all ages. There's really no such thing as you know, well, we're not really embracing this demographic because it's really everybody. I find that fun because in terms of the staycation model that we're looking into, um, it's identifying local attractions that different folks would be interested in or, or shopping or dining or recreation or um, popping on the bus with your bike and go here. Anyways, it's all of that. So a, a lot of fun things in the works. So what's your game plan going forward? It sounds like you've got, you've got a lot happening right now. Is kind of the goal to, to weave uh, into the fabric of the community so people see the transit system as, you know, yeah, so just, we, as, we, just as good as jumping in my car. Yeah. So we've started some really important dialogue with uh, important community partners, including the Visitors Corporation and their members. And so um, I don't want to prematurely promise anything, but we're, we're in important conversation to make that happen, to really connect the community with local attractions, dining, shopping, and, and, and making it just more than um, I mean, we, we got, of course, we want commuters to use it to get to right, work, sure. but to make it fun and a weekend outing and don't worry about parking downtown. Let us do the driving, that, that type of a thing. That's perfect. Especially in a city like this, where yeah. you've got so much happening in the downtown and people might've had a, an adult beverage or two when they're there. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, well, thanks so much for being with us and Thank sharing you. with us how you're wrapping all these great improvements into messaging for the public. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank Paul. Thank you for listening to another episode of Transit Unplugged in Depth with Paul Comfort. And thanks as well to Steve Bland and his leadership team at the Nashville Metropolitan Transit Authority for their amazing insights into what an innovative and forward-thinking transit agency is like. Next week on Transit Unplugged News and Views, we're delving into microtransit. Folks from Waymo and TransDev that should be a really interesting episode. You don't want to miss that. If you have questions, comments, feedback, or you'd like to be a guest on Transit Unplugged, feel free to send us an email at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.